Uh, before we actually can deep dive into the fun part where I can show you actually what the digital transformation uh, looks like, I'll have to explain to you how we managed or how we are still uh, on the way to transform an over 100-year-old company, which is purely industrial and very product-driven, into a customer experience-oriented company. It took a lot. Well, it took us a lot of effort uh, because, you know, back in 2013, when we started that journey that is still ongoing, and it uh, probably will ongo for quite some time, we had to slay some dragons in order to achieve that. First, we were facing heavy commoditization. Uh, you can, as you can imagine, kitchen sinks is not something that only a Swiss company can produce, uh, but a lot of companies, actually, especially also from our Asian friends. Uh, then, we were extremely exp uh, out. Uh, uh, we had an enormous increasing vol volatility in, in our markets, especially in emerging markets, uh, Russia, Brazil, uh, also China at the moment. And then, and this was the most important one, we were extremely complex as an organization. We have four divisions, and they all did what they wanted, and they all did what they should not do. Uh, so, for example, we had more suppliers than Daimler, and we had more items on stock than IKEA. And believe me, we are not as big as IKEA, and we're not as big as Daimler. <laughs> and finally, we had a huge focus, and we heard that before from my pre-speaker, we had super engineering, super products, we knew that our products are the best in the world, but we forgot something very, very important with it. What is it that our customers really want? Well, that made me tell you that the, the results uh, became more and more less desire, desirable, so we had to do something. It was not some, that we thought, okay, let's change the company for good uh, because it's so much fun. No, actually, probably the company would not exist anymore or would, let's say, be almost gone by, the, by now. So what did we do? We looked at ourselves and we went into ourselves and we asked, why are we here? What does Franke do in order to survive in this, in this world? What do we do for our customers? What do we do for our consumers? How can we win them? What is the reason why we are here every day? And we discovered that actually there are lots. There are many things that we do very well. And we discovered that with this engineering approach, we did all the products that we did with a little bit more twist, with a little more push, with a little more quality than maybe our competitors. So we made the everyday, which our products are, a little bit less everyday. So that's how we transformed this company into a company which should be make it wonderful. But how can we live, to that, up, live up to that promise? Believe me, a slogan is a slogan. You can put that out and think, everybody, oh, it's great, make it wonderful, super. And, uh, but what if the employees with the people everywhere in this company, really from sales to marketing to customer, to after sales to, to, uh, to organization to back office, if they don't believe in it, then it's just a slogan and will never work. So we have found out that we had to transform the whole company. So we created the One Frank Initiative. The One Frank Initiative was actually the goal to have one strategy, one culture, and one brand all over the company. And believe me, that transformation process is still ongoing. <laughs> First, the one brand. We decided to fight commoditization with a strong brand, which, of course, is a good thing. But in a B2B world where most co our customers actually uh, have to follow that, that, that kind of goal, how do you convince your partners, your trade partners, your, uh, and your employees to live by that brand behavior? So we went to our four divisions, the kitchen systems division, which is, which is residential kitchens, the food service uh, division, which does actually mainly food chains like McDonald's or Burger King kitchens, then our professional coffee machine uh, division, and our, our water system division, which does actually public uh, water uh, washrooms. Every one of them had to think about what does make it wonderful mean for my division? How do I transform my division into this make it wonderful sense? So we started actually to communicate not the product itself, but we found out that if you, for example, open up a coffee shop, your coffee machine is important. Yes, it is, as long as it works. 
If it doesn't work, it becomes even more important because then actually you don't make money. But what we wanted to show is the dream that these people, our customers, have when they buy our products. Because their dream is not to have a coffee machine. Their dream is to open up a coffee shop where people come, where they gather, where they drink, where they have fun. This is what they dream of, not the product. The product is the means to it. We also focus directly on our customers. We let them speak for us. Because, you know, talking about a product is one thing, but talking about an, a, a successful, um, uh, um, successful entrepreneur, how, what it means to have our products in his, in his stores, that's important, that's relevant. So what we found out is actually that our consumers, they have a lot of touch points with us from early morning till, till late in the evening. Even though we were a company that nobody actually knew, okay, they knew kind of the logo, uh, but not, a lot of people didn't know what we actually do. That was another reason why we started to put our solutions to the front and the products a bit to the back. We also started to work again with people that could transport our message more precisely and more with higher credibility than we could. And of course, we started to communicate also the customer and consumer relevance of our products. If, if it is design, if it's functionality, if it's whatever. But this was really important to transform the message. But then the culture was actually even more important. I can tell you that for the first one and a half years of the rebranding, 80% of our marketing budget was used internally for our own people. We didn't go to the market, we didn't spend millions, because we don't have that anyway, but uh, it was more important to convince our people what Make It Wonderful stands for. And we are still on it, and we created this camp. Camp is Change Ambassador Program, where our own people were transporting that message all over the world to the last corner of our company, and still do. We are at the moment in the third wave of this Change Ambassador program, where everybody, and these are normal employees, that they are the ambassadors of that change. So we can actually reach our goal, and we can get actually back where we, where we want to be, a very, very start, good, growing, and profitable company. This had also a huge impact on our marketing strategy. So our marketing strategy, was actually to be found and recommended. Because you know, in a B2B world, we cannot go to mass consumers. Because actually, how many people do build a kitchen at the same time? This is a few percentage. So we had to find another way of reaching our customers, of getting their customer experience to a level when they buy a kitchen. Because this is actually quite, <laughs> that's not an easy process. It takes a lot of time. You need a lot of decisions to take. You know, you go to a kitchen builder, how oh, shall I do this, shall I do that, shall I take this thing, shall I, take, shall I do that? So we have to be where people, where it matters. We have to be at the right point, the right time, and this was actually, this still is our marketing strategy. So we started working with architectural platforms in order to post our messages. We built a new website, which is actually one of the reasons why I'm here, <laughs> which was based purely on customer experience. But you know, we have different customers. We have customers and consumers coming to our website, so we had to reflect on that. So we did customer journeys. So uh, because a business partner, he has different kind of needs when he comes to our website than a consumer. But we, need, we needed to actually to attract both. And that was quite hard, actually, in the concept phase to, to understand how do we do that in order to not to bore one side and to, 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 to catch everybody. We transformed completely the way we did trade shows. 
away from just products to more living kitchens, to actually to, to feel, to touch, to, that people can experience our products where, where they are. The right time. Social media prepares our ground for somebody who is actually looking or getting inspired for new kitchens. And of course, communication that is also feature and relevance based as for the consumer. We also were talking about our projects. You know, let actually people experience where we do, what we do, and how we do it, and not just what the product looks like, looks like. And last but not least, with, with our partners, our trade partners, we have, tra we have a new training platform, we have a new loyalty-based program, and in the end, and now actually comes the fun part, I will hand over uh, to my colleague Chris Han from, uh, from Inside, because he will show you what we did in order to transform the selling process of our products into the digital world. And uh, let me welcome you, Chris Hen. Thank you very much for being here and doing that. Hello, everyone from my side. Good morning. I think one of the best tests if a new brand and a slogan is truly working is to see whether it actually affects your own behavior. And we were the partner to actually implement the website. Um, at least that was what we thought we were doing initially. Um, we are, from Inside Solutions, we usually implement Adobe-based projects, um, Adobe Experience Manager, Adobe Experience Manager screens. We also more recently focus on mobile applications as well as virtual reality, and it's the last point that we're going to focus on um, right now. So the first task here, our first mission was fairly classic. Implement a new website according to the new brand and roll it out in more than 50 countries and I believe some 100 languages in the meantime. And we are quite far through that mission and it's going very well. And I think Renato has some very positive first results in terms of uh, key performance indicators, etc. But this is business as usual. This is nothing new. Every one of us has a home page. Every company has a home page. So the question was, can we go beyond that? And I'm very thankful that Renato challenged Insight very early on in the process, actually, of following the brand that they have recreated in order to think outside the box and maybe come up with some new ideas. And the concrete point was, could we come up with a way to reinvent the business of selling kitchens? Now, some really big names in the industry were coming to our rescue. Uh, the first one is Facebook. It has nothing to do with Inside or Franke, but these are just things that happen. And uh, a couple of years ago, in 2014, Facebook bought a company called Oculus for $2 billion. All these guys do, they produce goggles for virtual reality, as you see in this uh, slide here, where you see many people sitting in a large audience. So picture you with all glasses on your noses. Um, I hope the future doesn't look quite like that, but certainly it will be one aspect. Now, what Oculus does, it focuses on virtual reality. And that is really something new in the sense of that it touches every single household this year and the next, mostly through gaming. But um, some other things happened that made virtual reality in the classic web much more real in the sense that in 2014, something happened at the standards level that most people didn't notice, but this is really crucial for the kinds of things that we want to do together. And this is that Apple was the last company to join the 3D content standard for the web, which is called WebGL. And with that, we really had a foundation for more than 3 billion devices on this planet that are capable of not just showing pictures and movies, but also interactive 3D objects. And we call that virtual reality for short. Now, what also makes this possible is that every one of us today carries a smartphone in our pocket that has a power that is comparable to the fastest computer on this planet from just 20 years ago. Now, this computer was built at the University of Tokyo in 1996, so it is 20 years ago. It cost more than $100 million, or inflation-adjusted $200 million. About 200 scientists had to share it. 
And today, you have exactly that same compute power in your pocket. And I'm sure you are not sharing your phone with anyone. So all these things are coming together. And for some people, this is still not enough in order to believe in a revolution. But for those who don't believe, uh, there is one company called Gartner who tells what's true and what's not from the rest. And uh, Gartner just announced recently that virtual reality is actually one of the top 10 strategic trends for the next year to come. So Renato and us, I think we're uh, quite well on the path here and focusing on the right thing. Now, one of the things that we did not do, we did not follow the craze regarding the goggles. And there is a specific reason for that. We did a lot of user testing. And it's great if you are playing a game. But if you're trying to buy a kitchen, you're not playing a game. You're not shooting up your, your kitchen parts. You're actually trying to fall in love, what eventually you're going to make a significant investment in. And for that, it takes time. And it takes collaboration. It takes sharing an experience. And it's just still a little bit too hard to do with these goggles. We believe they will play a very important role. And they have wonderful use cases. They're not just related to virtual reality, but also to augmented reality. But in order to help digitally sell a product, we felt we had to go another way. And here comes my own personal background. I actually do virtual reality since almost 30 years now. I was part of the first revolution, which uh, got unnoticed uh, by most uh, of you, I guess. But uh, already some close to 20 years ago, um, we introduced virtual reality in some industries. And the company that we are hosted by here, BMW, was one of the first ones to embrace it in order to change the way cars are designed and built. And many other industries that have heavy investments and need to make really complex decisions, they used virtual reality to actually improve the decision processes to build products or to search for oil or to build planes and similar things. So in a certain way, we can rely on the experiences made in the first generation of virtual reality, which didn't point us to these goggles. They pointed us into the direction of large-scale displays. And this screen here is a fantastic example for this, because we're all sharing this one screen and this one experience. So now the idea, and applied to the case of Franke, was relatively simple based on that background. Why don't we create reality centers that have very large screens that we can enjoy without using any additional kind of tools, that we can just stand within. What you see here is actually the lab that I ran um, in uh, the end of the 90s. It was a room 10 by 10 meters. It had a screen that was 8 meters wide, 2 and a half meters high. And literally, when you were sitting in front of it, it felt every single inch of your field of view. And when we projected digital content, that literally changed your personal experience. And so the idea we had was to apply this to the selling of kitchens. Now, that room back then cost $4 million to build. Um, I guess that's a little bit outside, perhaps, I don't know, <laughs> of the marketing budget of Renato. But the good news is we're now like 15, 16 years later. And so we could actually recreate one of these reality centers with consumer electronics. So we did nothing else but um, reconstruct a room with projectors and with, with uh, laptops and PCs and got the whole thing going for less than 10K. And here I have a little video that actually shows you how we have transformed a room with three walls. And every single wall, you're actually seeing a web browser. This is browser-based content. It is 3D in the sense of that it's just uh, a 360-degree panorama projected on a sphere. I'll just show that quickly again. So now that you, see, that you know what it is, you see it a little bit better. So you clearly see the three walls, but you see one seamless picture pasted on a sphere. And a gentleman in the middle is controlling the content via his mobile phone. And so he can rotate it in all directions. And you see this is a really seamless experience. And in terms of content, it's really trivial. It is just a large picture. So the question is, what can we change when we use these 3D standards on the web to the fullest, and we start using 3D content? 
So over the year, we have done many experiments. This is now just on one wall, but you see this is again a browser, and we're showing 3D objects that we treat as content that we're actually hosting in the Adobe Experience Manager. Um, we have combined this with videos that we have sourced from uh, YouTube, actually. So this little waterfall outside, this is simply a stream coming in via Adobe Experience Manager screens. And taken all together, we were pretty much encouraged to go further in that direction. But rather than showing you movies of what our experiments, we thought we'd bring this as a live experience here. And I hope it works as well as it worked yesterday. So let me just go back here to the laptop. And as you see, this doesn't really take a, a, a big server. If we can have the projection on the full screen, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so here I have this little toy. This is uh, used by product designers that are working a lot with 3D. We've just simply uh, stolen <laughs> one of their uh, work tools. And what it does, it does allow me to work with or interact with my objects in a way that, that would, with a mouse, just not in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. And um, first thing is going to that we're zooming out of this environment so that I can explain to you what we're looking at. This is Google Chrome. This is a web browser. This is the normal web browser that you are using every single day on your own system. It could be Firefox. It could be um, Apple's browser. But now we have 3D content. And when I use this tool here, um, I'm literally interacting with this environment. You see a little movie ongoing here on the outside. This is um, a panoramic movie which I uh, just shot two weeks ago in uh, Macedonia. And we have combined that with a very nice looking apartment with which some of our artists have uh, worked on quite a bit. And uh, here is the Franca kitchen. And this is of course just a prototype where we're just em em embarking on a larger scale project that will allow us to actually change every single aspect of this kitchen. We can change the, the tabletops, we can change the materials, we can change the products. And um, because it is a very sophistic, uh, sophisticated web page, we actually can interact also with content that comes from the outside. We can actually reuse content we already have. If we're going back to that screen here, this is actually another normal web page that we can put content on and um, that we can show, for example, a video, one of the videos that uh, you saw before. That, again, is stored in the content management system, so it means that this kind of 3D content can be managed like images, videos, and text. Okay, and with that, I give back to Renato. So, uh, what was actually the reason why we did that? And uh, what is the business case? Of course, it's a beautiful project, but I know being a CMO of the company, I have to uh, bring a good business case. I have to tell people, why do we do that? What is the reason? One reason is certainly our consumers, the customer experience. I can have to tell you a little bit about how kitchens normally are sold or how we bring our products into uh, our partners' showrooms. As you can imagine, a kitchen studio, the average kitchen studio, uh, believe me, they renovate about two kitchens per year in their, in their exhibit. Now, we have about several hundred different kind of combinations of our products when you, that, that we put into a kitchen. Now, I can tell you how long would it take for us, if we have a new product, to bring that to market. But even for the last 50 years, it took us maybe two to three years to get traction of a product being in the market so people could actually see it. That was one reason. One reason is that we don't want to be depending on just fixed, installed products in some showrooms. We want to show products that are new on the market. We want to show every combination, because as a consumer, you have the right to see everything. You know, you see what we or some other, some other company cho chooses you to see. Maybe you don't want that sink. Maybe you don't want that combination of your sink and, and that tap. Maybe you want a completely different hood for your kitchen. But what you see is what you get. 
And I don't mean that in a very, very positive sense in that, in that respect. That is one of the very, very big problems of our, of our industry. Because it's too slow. And it gives people not the right thing to decide. Because it's a huge investment. A kitchen, every one of you knows. I mean, a kitchen is not something that you buy every day. But believe me, a lot of my friends and a lot of my colleagues, they, they came back after half a year and said, I would do it completely differently if I could redo my kitchen. And that's something that we want to avoid in the future. So first point, certainly, we want to enhance the customer experience so they make the right decisions. Secondly, for our partners, it is much easier. Instead of renovating all their kitchens all the time, we bring them kind of our products closer so they can show it everywhere, every time, and at, 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 in every place. That makes us as a partner more reliable. That makes us as a partner more attractive. And that's our business goal, actually, to get loyalty, to get our customers, and our customers, in a sense, our trade partners, to actually work with us even closer. So the business case is actually very, very simple. It has cost implications, because we don't have to actually build the products and ship them and, and, and distribute them and make sure that they're, that they're, uh, that they're in, the, in the showrooms. And secondly, we become first choice because we let our consumers decide which, which kind of products they want to have in the kitchen. And we, don't give, we give them all the options that they want. And that is actually the two pillars of our strategy why we do this project. And in a second wave, I want people to take home these configurations. I want them to play around at home with it because as decision takes so long, you know, people will change. Shall we do the champagne? Shall we actually shall, shall we choose the color? Shall we choose it differently? They can ask their friends because you know, a lot of, lot of people are involved in such a decision. And the more you ask, actually, the, the, the better your decision making is. And we want, we want them to share that experience that's why we want them to share it everywhere. We want them to share, actually, in, in social media. We want them to share, we want them to ask your friends on Facebook, what do you think? Which combination shall I take? And people actually can walk through the room of your new kitchen even before it's built. So I think it's actually self-explaining that this is a very, very good business case for us. And believe me, the investments in comparison to building a showroom or building a fixed installed showroom is actually <laughs> quite reasonable. I don't say cheap because I still have to work with them, but um, <laughs> reasonable. So that was it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that we can go on with this journey. I hope that in a year from now, uh, maybe I can tell you how everything was growing, how, how many places, how, how far we already are in that, in that journey, because believe me, it is a journey. It is not a point in time when you do that. It is actually a longer strategy, and you have to keep it on. It's not something that comes. Uh, that you have to work hard on and every day, and you have to continue to develop, because otherwise it dies. And uh, that's, uh, I think, my main message of today. Thank you very much.